If we have a more complicated circuit which consists of multiple stages like this, what we are likely to find is that the data at every clock edge comes out of a flip-flop. It then proceeds to go through multiple combinational logic circuits or elements and then arrives at the input of some other flip-flop. And all of this has to happen fast enough so that it is ready at least one setup duration before the next clock edge arrives at the subsequent flip-flop. A few examples of such paths are marked over here. For example, you could see that if I go out of Q1, I then pass through the gate U1 and come back to Q1. This is an example of a path, which is what we would call a register to register path. It starts from a register Q1, goes through some combinational logic and comes back to the input of the register Q1, which you would normally call D1. Another such path is also marked over here. It starts from Q1 again, but now goes through U1 and U2 and comes back to Q2, right? So this would essentially be from Q1 to U1 to U2 and I'll mark this as D2 to indicate this is the input of Q2. Okay. So all such paths that start at registers and end at registers need to be considered. And we need to make sure that for such a path, what is the delay that we have? It would essentially consist of the T C Q for flip flop one plus the delay of unit U1 plus the delay of unit U2 plus the T setup of flip flop U2. This entire delay must be less than or equal to the clock period that is used for the circuit. If it is not, it means that the second edge at Q2 will come at a time such that it is before the data that came out of Q1 has had a chance to settle properly at the input D2. Therefore, T clock has to be greater than or equal to TCQ1 plus D of U1 plus D of U2 plus T setup of 2. And we can write the same equation for all the combination for all the register to register paths that are present in the circuit. Now, what about a path like this from X to Y or from X to Q2, right? These are also paths that need to be considered for the timing. And the normal way that we would consider this would be to say that even though X is an input that's coming from outside, after all, this circuit that I'm building is going to be used in some larger setup where there is also the input, the input X is also going to come as the output of some flip-flop. And similarly, the output Y is also going to go into some flip-flop. Therefore, I can assume that there is an implicit flip-flop over here with its own clock. But as a simplifying assumption, I could probably assume that TCQ is equal to zero unless it is otherwise known. And similarly, I would have this going in here to another D, which in turn uses the same clock. And what I would assume over here is that the T setup is equal to zero, unless otherwise known, right? So what we are saying in other words is the boundaries of the circuit once again have to be assumed to be flip-flops. But because I do not know whether they are the same kind of flip-flops, whether they are from the same technology or whether they are going to be designed by someone else, as an optimistic approach, I could sort of say that I'm going to just assume that I don't know anything about them. And therefore I will choose either T setup and TCQ equal to zero, or I could choose some pessimistic values and say, you know, I expect the delays to be at least this much and use that in order to do my computation of the clock period. So with all that in mind, let's take a concrete example. We have numbers over here, where essentially what we see is the T setup is two nanoseconds. T hold is one nanosecond. T CQ is three nanoseconds. The T XOR is three, T AND is two, and T naught is one. Okay, so now what are all the paths that we can think of? We have one path out here, which basically says 
for this i need t clock greater than or equal to t c q plus t u1 plus t setup which is basically equal to 3 plus 3 plus 2 8 so t clock must be greater than or equal to 8 nanoseconds another such path that i can get is this longer one which says that the same t clock must also be greater than or equal to same 3 plus 3 plus another 3 plus 2. This is for u1 and this is for u2. Or in other words equal to 11 nanoseconds. Right? But it turns out that in this case we have yet another path which basically starts from q2, goes all the way through this logic, comes over here and comes all the way back to q2. What is the delay that I have through this path? I basically have t c q plus t u naught plus t u1 plus t u2 plus t setup which is basically equal to 3 plus 2 for the AND gate plus 3 for the first XOR gate another 3 for the second XOR gate and 2 for the setup time. So a total of 13 nanoseconds. Similarly, we might also have to consider paths like this, which is the pin-to-pin -pin direct delay, where we essentially have T clock must be greater than or equal to T U0 plus T U3, which is basically equal to 2 plus 1. Or we might have something which basically says that this is a so-called pin to register delay, which would say that T clock is greater than or equal to T U0 plus T U1 plus T U2 plus T setup, which is basically equal to 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 2 or 10 nanoseconds. By working through all of this, the bottom line is that we find that the largest delay is this value, 13 nanoseconds that we see over here. And therefore, the T clock, minimum value for the T clock that we can use has to be greater than all the different constraints that we have seen. And the only value that satisfies all of those is to choose 13 nanoseconds. So what does this mean? It basically means that I can apply a clock, which is some kind of a square wave. I don't really care too much about the duty cycle of the square wave because after all, I'm only interested in the locations of the positive edges of the clock. Okay. And this clock needs to have a minimum time period of 13 nanoseconds so that this circuit as shown over here will operate correctly without having any problems of the wrong data getting captured or of any problems like metastability or other uncertainties creeping into the system. 13 nanoseconds basically implies a frequency which is 1 over 13 nanoseconds which is approximately 70 or so megahertz. 10 nanoseconds would have corresponded to 100 megahertz. 13 nanoseconds is essentially 1000 divided by 13 megahertz because a nanosecond is 10 to the power of minus 9 seconds. So this is the way in which we can find out the speed at which a circuit can operate. We need to essentially do the timing analysis for all possible combinations through the circuit and find out how, what is the longest such critical path. Right? This red uh, path over here that we have is essentially what would be called the critical path which is the longest combinational path between pairs of registers in the circuit. That determines the maximum frequency or the minimum clock period that can be used on this circuit. Now, what happens for larger and larger circuits? Typical large circuits today could have thousands or millions or possibly even more such 
paths to be considered. On the other hand, even though it looks like that is extremely complicated and difficult to do, it turns out that million is actually not a very large number in the context of computers. Because after all, we are now talking about computers with gigabytes of memory, possibly even up to terabytes. But more importantly, the timing analysis, the algorithms involved themselves are deterministic and can be run in polynomial time. So even though it is difficult to keep such large circuits completely in memory and do the analysis accurately, it is possible and is in fact done on a regular basis using design automation tools. One major concern is to do with the effects of environment, temperature and so on. Even though we said that digital circuits are essentially resilient to the effects of environment and temperature, the one part where they do get affected is their speed because it turns out that as transistors speed up or rather heat up, they can deliver less current and in general they slow down. On the other hand, by effectively cooling the circuit down, they are able to deliver larger currents and that in turn makes them run faster. This can have a fairly significant effect and one way to analyze this is by using extensive Monte Carlo analysis across different environmental conditions and temperature conditions. And in fact, given the number of different combinations of environment, temperature and so on, one area of research was to do with so-called statistical analysis of such circuits. Now, overall, statistical and static timing analysis is a very important design automation problem but has been fairly well studied over the years and is considered to be a reasonably well solved problem. Nowadays, there are some interesting variants of this problem, primarily to do with how to analyze uncertainty and how to sort of reduce the pessimism of various kinds of analysis. But the algorithms themselves are well known and implemented quite efficiently in computers. Now, a very brief word on power consumption, which is yet another issue that you would be interested in as far as the operation of circuits is concerned. The same circuit that we saw for looking at the delay of a gate also shows that the fact that we are charging a load means that some current is being drawn from the power supply. Now, this in turn causes some power to get dissipated in the driver transistor even though it may not be evident from the way the, the system is structured, you can do the calculations more accurately. And it turns out that during the phase when the output is rising from zero to one, energy is drawn from the source, partially dissipated in the PMOS transistor, and some amount of the energy gets stored on the load capacitance. What happens to that energy during the second phase? Because after all, every uh, output that goes high at some later point is going to go low. And when it does, whatever energy was stored on the capacitance will get dissipated through the NMOS transistor and essentially dissipated as heat. Now, you can do the math more carefully. We are not going to work through it over here. It turns out that the energy stored on the capacitance, as you know from physics, is proportional to the square of the supply voltage. And the power consumption is essentially proportional to the number of times the entire system can possibly toggle or change in a uh, the number of times it can toggle in a given unit of time. Therefore, for our purposes, the main takeaway from all of this discussion is the fact that the overall power consumption is proportional to the output load capacitance or the sum of all the capacitances in the circuit and to the square of the supply voltage and directly proportional to the operating frequency. What does this mean? Larger gates with higher capacitance are going to consume more power. A higher operating supply voltage will mean a greater power dissipation and trying to run a circuit at a higher speed is also going to result in greater power dissipation. Now the voltage in particular is a bit tricky because what happens is ideally we would then like to operate at the lowest possible voltage. The problem is if I lower the operating voltage, it turns out that the current that can be delivered by the transistor correspondingly decreases and thereby the going back to the delay of the transistor, the delay will increase. So it's 
not possible in general to reduce the voltage beyond a certain point without impacting the operating frequency. And therefore, we have an interesting engineering trade-off once again. We would like to keep the voltage high so that we get fast transitions and a high operating frequency. But we would like to keep the voltage low as well as the frequency low in order to reduce the power consumption. Now, a brief word on the concept of pipelining. Pipelining essentially looks at a path or a circuit that looks something like this. Let's just consider individual elements over here without worrying about what their functionality is. Supposing we have a chain of gates, or these could be modules, larger, more complicated modules as well. This would have some, each gate over here has a certain delay associated with it. And what we can say is that the D clock through this entire system is going to be greater than or equal to dA plus dB plus dC plus dT. Now, what would happen if I somehow magically was able to introduce a register somewhere in the middle over here? Now what happens is I have two equations, T clock greater than or equal to dA plus dB and T clock is greater than or equal to dC plus dd. Combine these and we get it should be greater than the max of dA plus dB and dc plus dd. In the ideal situation where each of the values dA, dB, dc, dd are more or less equal, the introduction of this one flip-flop could potentially bring my critical path delay down by a factor of almost two. Almost because it also does introduce the setup time and the TCQ corresponding to the flip-flop itself. Now, can this always be done to a circuit? Can I take any circuit that I have and always arbitrarily introduce a flip-flop somewhere in the middle? No, it is not as simple as that. There are restrictions on what is allowed to be done, but it there are a number of situations where it is possible to do this and to actually bring down the delay through a circuit. The problem is you cannot just insert it anywhere without changing the functionality. So you need to have a clear picture of what is the functionality associated with the circuit before you try to introduce registers and it has to be done in a very careful and systematic manner. Now we will be talking a lot more about the concept of pipelining in a CPU but in the context of a CPU that is a fairly different kind of operation and it happens at the instruction level as far as the uh, processor is concerned. The core idea still remains the same. We want to shorten the critical path in the circuit, but how exactly we decide where the registers can be placed and how they can be introduced is dependent more on the type of functionality that we want from the processor. So to summarize, larger transistors can drive more current, but they tend to have more capacitance. Higher voltage is required for more current drive but in turn means that the VI power will increase. Therefore, when we combine everything together, as far as timing is concerned, small load capacitance is good. It would mean faster switching. But on the other hand, it probably also means smaller transistors. High voltage would mean faster switching, which from the timing point of view is good. Large transistors would be able to deliver faster, higher currents. But on the other hand, that contradicts the first point of small load capacitance, because if I use large driver transistors, that in turn would be a large load for the previous stage. From the point of view of power, what we have is small capacitances, low power, low voltage, low power. The entire process of digital design ultimately comes down to how do you handle all of these different trade-offs and come up with a good architecture that meets your time requirements without consuming much more power than what is required.